Welcome to Experience Focus Leaders. I am tickled pink to uh, introduce you to Andy Cunningham. She's the founder and president of Cunningham Collective, author of the bestseller Get to a Har, Discover Your Positioning DNA and Dominate Your Competition, which, by the way, was recently featured in Times Square. Andy has played a key role in the launch of a number of new technology categories and products, including little known product that she worked on with Steve Jobs called Apple Macintosh. Andy, welcome to the pod. Uh, thank you, Ivan. Great to be here. Andy, positioning is a topic that there is a lot of confusion around, and some people confuse it with branding, some people confuse it with category creation. Tell us a little bit how you define positioning and what are the biggest mistakes falling from that? That Maybe I just highlighted some mistakes, but you've probably seen way more of them. <laughs> what are the biggest mistakes that people make about positioning? Yeah, thanks, Ivan. So yeah, positioning is about finding uh, a unique spot on the competitive landscape that only you can fill. So mm. that's the foundational thing. But I like to quote Jack Trout and Al Reese, who wrote the first book on positioning, which is called mm -hmm. Positioning the Battle for Your Mind, and use their analogy, which is positioning is the real estate, owning the real estate in the mind of the customer, owning real estate in the mind of the customer. So that's really what it is. It's creating a space in their brain that is definable by your unique and compelling story. So whatever that is. So you got to find a white space on the competitive landscape that only you can own, which gets harder every year because there's thousands and thousands yes. of companies starting up all the time and articulating that in a in such a compelling way that it sticks in the brain of the cust potential customer. So that's what that is. So where do most companies fall down? Is it in the articulation part? Is it that they are just trying to build me two products and have a envy for the competitors and think they can do it better, faster, cheaper. <laughs> what, where do you see the kind of the, the landmines that we could? Yeah, avoid? I think the biggest landmine is that people, the people building most of the products that I work with anyway, are engineers and engineers have a, have a built in mentality that if they build it, people will come. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, and that just isn't, it just isn't so anymore. They're faced with a challenge today that they weren't faced with when I joined this industry some 35 years ago. We didn't, there weren't that many technology products. So it was not that hard to build it and they will come, mm -hmm. right? Because there was nothing there. But today, for example, in the world I live in, which is the MarTech world, there are over 8,000 MarTech products on the market today, technology products. And that tells you how many HR products there might be, how many finance products there yeah. might be, how many productivity tools. It's just bazillions. And so yeah. you can't, you can no longer just build it and expect people to come because everyone is building it and expecting people to come. So you have to come up with something unique and compelling that's going to attract customers to your product. And it used to be you could do that with new features because oh, it used to be that you come up with a brand new feature for your mm -hmm. CRM product and all of a sudden people turn their heads toward you and they chase you. But today, because there's so many of these products, you can't do that anymore. So what you have to do today is sometimes you have to think about your brand in addition to your product. Unlike what we used to do 30 years ago, where it was just product and the tech world has become accustomed now to thinking about the consumer marketing strategies of building a brand. So we have to build a brand for these guys. So you have to find that that unique and compelling thing about your brand. We call it an ownable brand concept. Okay. What is your ownable brand concept that only you can have? And that and it can be, it doesn't have to be about a product feature like it used to be. It can be about something softer than that. It can be about something that has to do with the the attraction that you have to your customers, like Apple, for example. Apple mm. isn't so much a product brand anymore as it is an identity brand, right? It's and you you have a feeling, you have a relationship with the Apple brand. Mm -hmm. And Steve figured that out when he came back to Apple and it was a brilliant thing. And that's why people are attracted to Apple because now you're part of an ecosystem that you can't get out of, right? So they've locked you in with product, but they've also locked you in with a badge of identity. I'm an Apple person. <laughs> right. And that's an example of one of the world's best brands, right? But even smaller companies can figure out what is that emotional connection that you're trying to build with your customers and capitalize on that. But it's funny that you bring up Steve and we were talking earlier, <laughs> we are talking about other folks that have followed Steve in the later days, that like Hiroki Asai. 
But the my, my take on having watched the launch of Macintosh and the way the positioning speeches, which were referring to World War II kind of level of campaigns in really painting the enemy out of the conventional IBM way of doing things. It felt there already was this identity that we are going to be either the pirates or the rebels or, right. or whatever, what, what the kind of the non-conventional folks. And this was earlier, right? This was not back in the days when like we're now you know, all know. So this is still Apple. Is it still an upstart? So what was it about um, Steve, what you taught him, like what the Regis McKenna best practices <laughs> that you brought? Because I, I have heard that he was not nearly as good at the beginning at some of these communications, <laughs> right? So guide, I think an audience would love to hear like before and after Steve Jobs, right? right? Like the techie, un unpolished version. And then for me, like I already saw some of these presentations in, in the bow tie kind of era, they were already very Polish. So it sounds like you already got, had the impact there. Like there, there was a storytelling and framing there. So guide us before. Famous. Sure, sure. So let me just correct one thing about this. I didn't do these things for Steve. Steve had this idea of what he had a vision of what he wanted to do. And those of us around him helped him do it. We didn't give him the vision and then he executed it. So I got to be very clear about that. Secondly, Regis McKenna, the guy that I worked for at the time, was a mentor to Steve for many years. So there was a very special relationship between Regis and Steve, which enabled me to have a very special relationship with Steve that other people from the outside world did, didn't have. But that said, what Steve was really into is, was the rebellious, the pirate flag on top of the building, the anti-IBM stuff, all of that. He thought that the way to build this brand was to create this rebel vision of a computer and a product that people would want to use because it wasn't the status quo, because it wasn't the status quo. And what we found when we launched this product is, guess what? No one was buying it because <laughs> people wanted to buy the status quo. So the Macintosh did not succeed until Steve came back to Apple eight years after he was fired, when he came up with the idea of his tribe. I also want to just say one other thing. We did a focus group right before we launched Macintosh. We did with Mike Murray, who was heading up marketing at the time at, at Macintosh. And we did a focus group of a bunch of, I would call them, they weren't necessarily, we didn't really have the title of CTO then or CIO then, but it was the people who were leading the charge inside of companies for buying technology. Now, remember, this right. is 1983. So this is early, early on. And the focus group was we brought in a Macintosh to each of these groups of people, let people play with it, played around with it. And the questions that we were asking, they were so enthused. They were so excited. They loved the product. You could tell it was just oozing out of their pores. And the very last question we asked them all was, so do you think your company would buy these things for the folks inside the company? And to a person, the answer was absolutely not. We will never buy this product. And that moment was the sh oh shit moment <laughs> before we launched Macintosh that actually informed or was a forecast, if you will, of what would happen when we started to sell the product and it didn't sell. We were trying to position it as a business machine against IBM and it wasn't a business machine. It didn't have a lot of the features you need to, to be a business machine and none of these business people were going to go out on a limb and do something crazy via Macintosh. Just wasn't going to happen. So the product started to fail. Steve got upset about it because it was it was his baby, and he really had a vision that it could succeed, and that's what led to the fight that he had in the boardroom, and that's what led to him getting fired. And so when he got fired, I actually thought that Apple would kabosh the, the Macintosh, but for some reason they didn't. I have a feeling it was from because of a guy named Jean-Louis Gasset, who was a very important figure in the whole early days of Apple and Macintosh formation. But anyway, they didn't kill it, but it languished for eight years. And then Steve came back after looking at the market, looking at who was actually buying these things. And it wasn't business people, it was creatives. It was what we now call the creator community. <laughs> Those were the people buying Macintosh. And they would actually carry the big thing in. You know, Remember, it was really big. They mm -hmm. carried it under their arm with a coat over it so that their IT manager wouldn't see what they were bringing into the back room of their creative departments. And usually it was the graphics. So this was the original BYOD. It was the <laughs> BYOD. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. But it wasn't sanctioned right in the yeah, company. Yeah. So people were bringing it in 
and becoming super attracted to it. And Steve was watching this the whole time he was gone. He's watching what's going on with Macintosh. So that when he came back to Apple, he realized there's a tribe here and it ain't the business people that I thought it was. It's the creatives. Oh my God, what, an, what a brilliant insight. So then he started to create a marketing campaign for the creatives. And that's when that whole brilliant campaign. Right, it was the Einstein. So here's and the, everything. Think, yeah, here's a, yeah. think different. Yeah. Here's to the crazy ones, the Leonardo da Vinci's, the Albert Einstein's, blah, 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 blah. So it, it was it was quite a learning exercise for him. But when he came back and clarified in his own mind who the customer was, he was able to capture that tribe and then expand that tribe beyond what it was. So it's almost if I'm reading this between the lines, it almost feels like the market, the original office market that could afford the very first Macintosh was definitely not that rebel, even though we were you're going right. for that, right? Like it was too early and it, they were too corporate and they were too yeah. weaned yeah. on the IBM way of doing things. Exactly. Then, you remember, yeah. You remember the phrase, you never get fired for buying IBM? That's gone exactly. back 80 yeah. years. And that was yeah. very true in the early 80s. Yeah. Got it. And so what you would then a few later, that situation has changed. And and so some like some similarities of that message, maybe not extreme, less about the rebels and more about the creators, then that sort of resonated. So it going for, almost sounds like it went back to the original premise, but it <laughs> well, was just it did, like the market was, was more mature. And well, it was a different, different person, product. though. Yeah. It was a different person. The product was also slightly different, but the person was different. It used to be that Steve thought he could get, just for lack of a better word, the guys in suits to switch over from their IBM PC to the Mac. But that isn't, those aren't the people. It was the the long haired, tattooed, yeah. pierced group sitting back in the graphic design departments of these big companies that saw the benefit of it. And that's what started it all. The, the, he built a tribe out of those people because those people are typically, they're creative. They look different. They sound different. They act different. And they think different. Right. <laughs> and that's where the Think Different campaign came from. This is this is amazing because I, I think one of the things that is a problem when you're studying history is you don't know which lessons to take, which ones worked and why they worked, right. and why, why yeah. the ones that didn't. So <laughs> I have to admit, I loved some of that early kind of launch thing, launch things around the yeah. first Everybody Mac, did. right? Everyone uh, and it won a bunch of awards and put some careers on track, like yes, some of the most. Mine. Yeah, <laughs> but it, it's interesting the reasons why it didn't work, and it was basically misaligned. The positioning was exactly was the wrong person it in was, the organization. It was, it was a little bit early, probably for the creatives to buy their own yep. things as well. So it was a yep. little bit early to market. Um, yep, it was a positioning people. failure, is what it was. And so we all learned from that. Steve learned from it. Regis learned from it. I learned from it. We all learned from that. We thought that building something really beautiful and elegant and easy to use and that you almost had a relationship with, that no-brainer. Everybody's going to buy it. But that didn't happen. And let's dive in a little bit into the B2B world today Yeah. versus back then. Because you brought up the sort of the noise around all the tools out there. And we had Scott yeah. Brinker on the podcast who created that that chart in MarTag that intimidated yes. everybody. I love that chart. I love yeah, that. I think it's, you it's, didn't even I, have half of them on there, by yeah, the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it's more complicated because I know that we would play in multiple categories. So I don't even know. I don't think that chart even works that well anymore anyway, because yeah. there's blurring increasingly. I agree. Yeah. Um, yeah. But let's just say, so you have this B2B functional buyer historically, but now there's a different need to, I guess maybe we call it consumerize. You brought up the same kind of notion that right. you're bringing some yep. consumer techniques. So what's changing in the B2B world? Are people developing more intimate relationships with enterprise software, or is that still a traditional buying buyer journey with committees and lots of decisions and so on? Like, how, how well, like, do you yeah. think about this? I do think there are still, anytime you're buying something for a large enterprise, the procurement process is huge, right? And it's filled with red tape and bureaucracy and all the rest of that stuff. So that still exists. However, there are so many choices now for these companies to to buy software. 
and so many opportunities for them to partake in pilots of of new software that mm-hmm. might be better, but it's super cheap because it's a pilot. The options are just more, there are more options for these companies. So I think the more, the less, or sorry, the more risky of them, or the ones that are able to absorb risk a little bit better than others are open to using brand new products, right? Because they're cheaper, essentially. Mm. So that's that didn't exist back then. It was, oh, and IBM, right? That was what everybody was buying back in the day. So- It's different today because there are more options. And so when there are more options, and there's the sort of the cheaper is one dimension, but that's probably true, maybe for SMB businesses, that's highly important. But in some, I would say, back to feelings and experiences. So we're selling to mid-market and enterprises, but we were example wearing my relate to a hat. We've been deeply inspired by Apple. Obviously, and we have like advisors like Hiroki Asai, who also worked for Steve. And so we are saying, like, how can we take this human element where you're able to connect to the emotional needs of a person inside maybe a mid or large organization, but you make them feel proud about the work that they're doing, or they think of themselves as the type of person that's a good listener, but yet in their work, maybe they're producing the types of content things that are monologues equivalent yep. that don't listen to anybody don't get any feedback so you try to connect to their identity mm-hmm. and their aspirations or if they're a result driven designer which i'm not sure that exists a lot but if they care about results coming out of their work which i think ultimately right. it's a human need not Absolutely. just to express yourself but also see the impact of that there's a lot of professions that historically haven't been able to do so you could do that so you could tap into some of these needs that are less about the cost and yeah. more about the need to feel successful as a professional and a yeah. win. And so I'm curious, what are you seeing uh, succeed in that kind of breaking through that wall of features, yeah. functions, messy, messy, like product lists of competitors yeah. that all look and sound the same to get to that human level of positioning? To me, that's a brand issue, right? That's somebody really sensitive inside the company who's thinking about brand and thinking about how can we stand out with our brand. And really, Apple was one of the, probably I think the very first company to ever understand that you could have an emotional attachment to your product, right? An emotional attachment to a computer or some other computerized device. And that was a huge breakthrough in this whole marketing thing. (laughs) So what's happened since then is some companies, but not very many, some of them have realized that you can create an emotional connection with your product. And that's what you're talking about is how do you tap into that human need to belong, to contribute, to make a difference, to inspire people, all of that. But very few companies rely on that because what's happened today is that the world of technology products is all data-driven. We decided that emotional stuff is too hard for us to deal with, so we're just going to deal with data. And data is going to tell us what to do. And so a lot of these companies, that are especially engineering-oriented ones, are just data-driven. So if the data says that the customers are going to like red, they'll go with red. If the data says it's good, they're going to blue, they'll go with blue. Whereas uh, some of these companies, very few of them, are thinking deeper about the emotion. They're thinking mm. about how do I build an actual connection with these humans? How do I tap into the human needs? And by the way, the only people inside of companies doing that, sometimes the CEO, but usually it's the CMO and the CHRO, right? The human mm. resources. The procurement department doesn't give a shit about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that and the and in these really large enterprises, it's procurement that's making these decisions. And all they care about is price and features. So if you can override procurement with a value proposition that mm. actually makes a difference, I'm trying to do this with a company I'm working with today. We're trying to override procurement with a softer side, if you will, of what a product can do for a company and see if we can ha- make some headway there. But it's tough because you're up against you're up against data. <laughs> it's data or or I also see like in the B2B world, like somebody said, blue means it's trustworthy or safe or whatever is the yeah. color blue. Yeah. So then you see every company is like, blue, like yeah. it's okay. That was IBM. Yeah, IBM. It was IBM's color, right? So they're like, <laughs> so it's, there's a little bit of, uh, I would say uh, data. And then there's, I feel like la- like a conventionality almost because they're like, it's all about relationship. It's all about salespeople. We're going to put out some salespeople out there. 
and yeah. none of that soft stuff matters. In your book, I actually want to quote it because it covers this really well. Quote, positioning works in concert with its more emotive sibling branding, which right. offers an emotional expression of unique role and relevance for logos, look and feel, color palette, use of language, tone of voice, customer experience, and design. Yeah. Like maybe design, you would kind of think some tech, some product level CEOs are do care about design. I think that's a new generation uh, yep. is there. But yep. like some of these other elements, they don't feel as valued, right? Like it, it, right. You know, it feels like it's doesn't it's matter. It's like you reduce friction. People will care about reducing friction yeah. and maybe removing noise. And I think that's already a good step. But the softer... That's yeah. just a couple of those things that we just you just written there. Yeah, if you think about the functions in a company, okay, so you've got a couple of what I would call hard functions in a company. Finance is a hard function. No. Even product development to some degree is a hard function. But things like HR, things like marketing, things like planning, strategic planning, things like customer experience, these are all soft issues. Yeah. There, there is no hard answer to any of those. And by the way, there are more of these soft issues in a company than there are hard issues. And so I am a believer in thinking about solving these issues that are brought on by the soft things. Let's just take strategic planning as an example. That is not a hard science. <laughs> that, yeah. is, that is a gut feel, a vision, some market research goes into it, sure. But there's no mathematical equation that tells you how to strategically plan the future of your company. There has to be some... By the way, McKinsey consultants are crying right now. They're like, oh my God, I'm not going to be able to charge you know, millions <laughs> anymore. I speak, this is a former consultant, of course. Former, but, uh, yes, I, I understand. <laughs> but actually, the, the, the McKinsey consultants can be very helpful by injecting into the equation for strategic planning the humans that we're dealing with. We are yeah. dealing with human beings here, and human beings have certain needs, as you pointed out, and contribution to things, mattering, being inspired, all these things are soft things that are not dealt with with really hard features. So when you're building a brand, so this gets back to the brand building, yeah. that emotional side that I talked about is half the equation. You've got to be attractive to the humanness of a person who's going to use your product, whatever that is. So that's why it has to look good. It has to feel good in the hands. It has to give them an identity, has to make them feel that they can contribute all of those things. And all of those things are not, it's very difficult to come to solutions with about those things from a branding perspective with data alone. You have to be a human. Now, AI might be able to help us with this, as a matter of fact. It may so be- It's helpful. more polite. And if you try, if you give it enough prompts, it could come out- Exactly. You know, it was a much Topic softer, record. more humane <laughs> yeah. language. That's so- for, Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Let me just say one more thing. I think that we are entering into an era because of AI, because of the fear of AI, that the human side of everything is going to be a bigger deal now. And I think it's going to be a bigger deal because now we have to pay attention to it because we're all afraid that AI is going to take over the world and that we will no longer have the power to unplug it. So that's what I think we are moving into an era where brands are going to be more attentive to the emotional connection they build with their customers. I, I certainly hope you're right. And I think the motto that we have in our kind of organization is experience is the message, right? And so I think if yes. you, so I think it's just it's moving beyond the language, which because AI okay. is getting pretty good at the language and pseudo personalizing it. Yep. And getting to the broader experience. And obviously with Apple, it was like an experience theater and really very like everything from the moment you enter the store, the moment you receive a package. And the whole opening yep. thing was like a multi-sensory experience. And I, I think people got a little caught up with the language component of AI just because of the yep. nature that it's easy yeah. and everybody understands it. And I think the best communicators, the best, the best position brands created remarkable experiences. I, I agree. Powerful enough, right? That people would then word of mouth them, which was the most compelling sales yeah. army you could ever have a absolutely uh, experience is the, where the rubber meets the road I, lo I love that motto that you guys have because it's very true it's all about what the experience is and that experience is multi-sensory that's another great word you said we have to think about multi-sensoriness in in how we build brands today it isn't just 
a logo. Like it used to back in the 70s when Jack Trout and Al Reese wrote that first book on positioning, it was all about advertising. And you mm. just drew whatever picture you wanted to draw and say whatever you wanted to say and put that out there and it influenced people. But now people are influenced by all these channels that we have of communication and all of their peers and all of the likes and the reviews and the blah, blah, blah. So it's a much harder world today. I agree. But it's a, it's interesting you bring up Al Trout's book. So I did, despite, it's ironic, despite having had Wharton undergrad and Stanford MBA, that was not the, and the, having taken marketing courses, that was not the book that was in the kind of core <laughs> curriculum. Um, what was the book? Was it Peter Drucker's book? The ones that was really good that I would I remember that was for precursor that I took away was Cialdini's Cialdini's book on influence, right? The science. Yes. Oh, and that's a great. That's so, so there are some great. I'm not saying there weren't great books, but yeah. the 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 and then I discovered I, I I had right before Salesforce went public, I was doing some consulting there, and I, I went I, I did a summer internship, and they had a bunch of books. And that work you could pick up and use and they're encouraging it. And I was doing marketing work and like most prominently was all of the L Trouts, the, all of the positioning books, they were like all there. And then when you start thinking about you no know, software and all the other things that were happening at the time, like it was a master class at in, in positioning that Salesforce did back then. Yeah. And then like pretty much every year and a half, they reinvent themselves whatever is the new trend, Mark That's agile enough to jump on it and become the social company, the AI company, the whatever is the, the next thing is. And I think they still, while maintaining the thread, by the way, genuine thread about yeah. being customer centric, right? Which is, it's a really a customer company. So I think one of my hopes is that the folks that are earlier in their career, take a look at your book, understand that this is like the most successful companies, at least in the technology world that I observe, and obviously a lot of products that we use, like they really study this. And then Salesforce yeah. adapts it because they're creating like a Disneyland Dreamforce <laughs> that's coming up. So that's like B2B version of Disneyland. It with is. Fuzzy animals. And I have to tell you, like my kids, I got one of these animals and it's like my daughter's favorite toy. I know. Like, what do you do with that? What do you, how do you, that is, that's, that train has left on an emotional connection it, it to a totally brand. Has. And by the way, I want to point out about Mark Benioff. He is a brilliant marketer. Brilliant. He's one of the best marketing CEOs that I've ever seen or met or heard of. And his book, Behind the Cloud, tells you exactly the story of how he built Salesforce with marketing. Yep. <laughs> So yeah, it's amazing. I, I think marketing was like, and I, th I think he was holistic. And I think this is a back. I want to shift gears a little bit because we come from a marketing and maybe corporate communications world as well. But we found this gap, gaping hole around HR communications, a, you know, employee experiences. Right. And I was curious that you brought up that CHROs are the people that care about the soft right. things, the communications. I, I see a bit of a contradiction. I think like maybe on the recruiting side, companies are a little bit better, but we see this huge problems where they companies spend, for example, on comp and benefits. Like it's the, the comp is the largest expense and benefits is the second largest expense yeah. inside every company, right? And it's like what a quarter of our GDP is going on health and benefits related things. Right. Right. And to quote Warren Buffett, GM is a health and benefits company, it was an automotive division, right? Yes. So, some, so something like that. that, right? And then we look at these benefit communications that happen there, and nobody understands them, right? right. Like it's just, I don't think, I, I'm not even sure the insurance carriers that write these policies understand them, but certainly brokers struggle, HR struggles, right. and employees and their partners that have to make life-changing decisions about their health care uh, miss it. And so we see the sort of, you're spending a lot of money on something that's supposed to retain and delight and keep your employees happy. Right. And then they're all going around stressed about going bankrupt in the half American families because of a bad health care event, right? Which is right. Yeah. at least American level issue. So let's dive in what's going on in the employee experience and employee communications and positioning world, where do you see people leading? Where do you see people falling behind? And you know, that is you said, a yeah. 
Yeah. Super great question, Ivan, because what, what I'm seeing now from coming at me, okay, for help is we not only need to refresh our regular brand, we have to refresh our, they call it their employer brand, employer right? Employer brand, yes. Now this That's notion of employer yeah. brand has become yeah. a big deal, right? And now to me, they should be the same thing, but but people are really thinking about how are they going to get people to come into their company, get the talent they need, and to keep that talent. So all these things that you're talking about with the benefits and all that and the comp, it's all about retaining your workforce. That's what it's- Well, about. attracting as well. So we've okay. seen- yeah. Uh, so we work with some of these employer, like we transform employee benefit experiences. And it's amazing uh, to see that a lot of people now send them the general presentation on that right after they send the offer. Okay. So it's in spaces like healthcare, where you have yeah. very significant shortage of nurses, for example, that's the next step is, and you get, if we're investing in it, we want you to know it and we want this to be an attraction point. You're, you're right. It is all about attraction and retention, both yeah. of those things. Yeah. But like the, the, I I hear about the intention, right? So let, we all agree that it's a good idea. And it's good. Yeah. But, but I, and I worked in HR tech for a long time at a company called Success Factors. I've never felt that visual design was one of the fortes for an average <laughs> HR department. The, the HR department. Like, I think you would be lucky that the CEO cares and it kind of brings that spirit of maybe right. if the CEO is visual, like they bring that in. Obviously, companies like Facebook, they bring the technology innovation, they redesign their whole, right. they build internal tools. But what? how do you see, so there's the positioning and then there's the execution of that and the congruency around that. Do you see that breaking down or do you think it's... Am I just not looking at the right set? No, I, I think it's starting to change because I think that this issue of attracting and retaining talent has become a really big deal since the pandemic. It's always been a big deal in tech, but now it's like a really big deal because now employees are in charge, right? Employees are in charge. They go to the employer and they say, here's what I want. <laughs> I'm going to, I don't want to live in the city that you have any offices in. So I'm going to be remote. I want these kind of benefits. I want this kind of salary. And there, the balance of power has shifted to the employee. And so they move around a lot more, right? They get a better offer over here and they move over there. So what I think is starting to happen is we, companies are starting to think about building an emotional, a better emotional connection with their employees than the one they had before. So these are why the employee experience is becoming a much more critical factor in the equation because it feeds the emotional connection to the company. So it's more than just feeding people all day long and giving them massages, right? It's about culture and values and contribution and inspiration and these other bigger things that live up here. Got it. And do you think this is, because you hear like it's pushes back and forth, there's a pendulum, right? And, yeah. and do you feel like tech industry is somehow unique about this? Because of the talent shortage, or you think the cat is out of the bag globally? And this um, is the cat is out of the bag. I work with a, a small media company in Dubuque, Iowa. So okay. they're in the middle of the Midwest, and they are in an old business, the media business. But they're also experiencing this rapid turnover, if you will. Not as bad as we have out here with Meta or Google or any of that. But they are experiencing their employees finding opportunities elsewhere. So they handle it with, they have an ESOP so that they are structured under an ESOP, which means their employees have a stock ownership. All the employees the are owned. ownership. So that helps a lot because that gives them an emotional connection to the company. And I, I think it keeps them from losing people that other companies that don't have that structure have. But I think the cat's out of the bag. But in tech, it's way worse because the talent shortage in tech is just enormous. And especially now with AI, the number of AI engineers that we have is nowhere nearly enough. It's like the number of NVIDIA GPU chips that we have. It's not enough. <laughs> it's just not enough to, to serve the market. And the same is true with, the, with AI engineers. So in that world, do you feel like the, there is a significant disparity between those like really prized roles inside the company and then the ones that are still part of employer brand, but it's maybe not the highest in demand role. And how do companies reconcile yeah. that? Do you have one? Typically, like in large organizations, we've seen, we've had a chance to collaborate with Accenture in a number of ways. And I like their kind of terminology that they describe themselves as a culture of cultures. And mm -hmm. so there are, there are different yeah. teams. Uh, yep. They still have a common yep. you know, thread. 
but there is a enough and when you have 600,000 employees across the entire world you need to create diversity are you seeing the sort of the the micro atom like employee experience buckets within organizations where like there are people that are first status first class citizens so to speak and then that's, the rest of us that's true to some degree yes and i think it's true in in two industries. Today, I just learned, I was listening to Bloomberg this morning, and I heard all this stuff about the new sports compensation situation around their name, their image, and their likeness, right, which they're now calling the NIL. So now NIL in the world of sports is a big deal. And it's designed to help compensate athletes for their talent, right? But it's always just the top athletes. It's not the supporting athletes, just like in tech. The top athletes top designers, the top engineers are going to get the better deals than the lower ones. And it's just the way it is. I have a, a client who started a company and he was at Google and he was a good, really great engineer there, but he's one of a million engineers at Google, right? But when he just decided he was going to leave and start a company, he was offered like $10 million to stay, $10 million to stay. It, it's wow. <laughs> This is this creates a huge disparity because how many normal engineers at Google are getting paid like that? Yeah, this is where do you keep but the what is there one employer brand? Are there multiple employer brands, right? Because I think in the when we think of the go-to market, one of one of the guests in the pod and one of the thought leaders in the field of uh, customer centricity, Peter Fader, he basically says you could have a model where like you could value the customer's lifetime value very mm -hmm. precisely across different industries. And some customers are disproportionately more valuable than others. And so the question is, in the back of our minds, is this going to be the same story inside an organization? Do you have multiple employee brands, right? Because, for example, on the benefits, the people that are in the union uh, or that are nurses yeah. would get one set of benefits and the doctor and medical personnel would get another set of benefits, right? And it's probably accepted. But I'm curious what your thought process is on That's you know, a, that, that emergence, right? Are we going to mimic the customer world? Yeah, a very interesting uh, perspective. I hope that doesn't happen, but I think it. I think you may be right that it may be moving in that direction. I think companies are, they'll do anything they have to do to keep people. And so yeah. sometimes those are secrets though, right? The benefits of the people they want to keep are secrets from everyone else. I'll give you a $5 million bonus to stay. They're not going to make, that's not Thank a benefit. You. I am, I'm staying on this podcast, Andy. I'm, I'm in. <laughs> you're in. <laughs> but yeah, it's, so I think that's an issue. But the other thing that's happening in benefits, which I'm sure you're aware of, is that y y there's now multiple options that you can choose as an employee what your benefits are. You get X amount of dollars and you can choose. Yeah. I want this from healthcare. I want this from fitness. I want this from taking care of my pet. You know, there's all kinds yeah. of new options. And yeah. so even though it's not necessarily a strategy to give different people different things, the options are there for you to choose different things today. Right. So. Yeah, I think that's actually very, that is a liberating opportunity. And I think the organizations that are introducing this flexibility are gaining, yeah. are gaining in the market. So yeah. let's shift gears. So we talked about incredible individuals. And so from one of your episodes where you're featured on a podcast we like called the Marketing Book Podcast, uh, oh, yeah. you said... <laughs> Something about Apple under Steve Jobs was clearly a missionary organization. The next best, the next big thing kept happening again and again. And when Steve passed away, Tim Cook tried to do some of the things, but it hasn't quite worked. So let's come back to this sort of story or narrative of incredible visionary individual, the visionary CEO. And what happens when the CEO leaves the company or leaves leaves us, unfortunately? And what, how do organizations cope? And what do you see as sure. ways to maintain the trajectory post-CEO? post, post -CEO? I think a lot of times the trajectory shifts, which is okay because you can be successful in many different ways. So if you look at Apple, the part you left off of my quote there is that, but Tim Cook was left with assets that he multiplied over and over and over again and created the world's most valuable company. Yeah. Think of Satya Nadella taking over at Microsoft. He was not the visionary founder CEO, but yet he's been able to turn that company and now to, into the most world's most valuable company. So I think that what has to happen, in my personal opinion, is there has to be a leader, whoever that is, 
at whatever stage of the company it is, who understands what the, the highest value that can be created for that company at that time. For Steve Jobs at that time, innovating over and over again and using his visionary abilities to always see around the corner and build the next big thing was the highest value he could attach to that company. He passed away. Tim stumbled around a little bit for a while, seeing if he could do that, which he discovered he couldn't do that. But what could he do? He could con constantly add value to the ecosystem that they were creating. And so he found his way of adding amazing value to that company. But it wasn't in the same way that Steve Jobs was. The same thing with Satya Nadella. And, I'm, and the same thing is going to be true at Amazon. The value that is going to be built there going forward will not be the same as what Jeff Bezos put into it. But that's okay because it's still value. I don't think you should think about companies after they lose their founder or their the really visionary person that that's the end of the road for those companies. That's really just the beginning of mass attraction. And this is really a helpful insight. So what do you see, you name companies that succeeded in that next yeah. chapter, right? <laughs> there are quite a few it. that don't make it through yes. as much success and trillions in market cap add-on. And so- what do you see as the difference? Is it that the there's a sort of constantly learning DNA and the companies are re-examining themselves or they're shifting to 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 different models? Like what what I guess the winners in that sort of next chapter, second chapter, and the losers, how would you separate them? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'll just go back to something I said earlier. I think it's the soft issues of leadership. That are the difference. I, I had the opportunity to work with Kodak three times <laughs> under three different CEOs in an attempt to capitalize on the new digital uh, transition that the world was going through with digital cameras. You, your listeners probably realize that Kodak invented the digital camera. You'd think that they would learn how to capitalize on it. But here's what companies of that era fell victim to. They fell victim to their share price and their shareholders. Mm -hmm. And it, and the problem with Kodak was they were selling so much film that to put their attention and their resources into digital meant taking it away from the film. And it created this problem where they were not able to develop the digital stuff to the point to the market for it in favor of the film. And then all of a sudden, somebody else did and the cliff happened and they died and they couldn't re they couldn't reignite it. The person who changed this this practice of bowing down to shareholders at every opportunity that you have, which is what we were doing in the 80s and the 90s, was Reed Hastings at Netflix. If you recall, what Reed did at Netflix is he decided to move from the red envelope business to the streaming business. And this caused enormous amounts of shareholder up unrest and, and anger. And the stock price went boom, it tanked. But he knew he was also a visionary, he is also a visionary, and he knew that streaming was the future. And he just had to get through that rough patch with shareholders mm. to get to the other side. But CEOs before Reed, they couldn't do that. They couldn't see themselves jumping over that chasm. So they stayed on the shareholder value chasm. But Reed, Reed saw beyond it and, and was the first to jump over. So Interesting. So I would align the shareholder value was like successful category, right? So they, these companies were successful in yeah. a particular category, was a business model associated with that category. And then a shift happened either in consumer expectations, right? Technology, economics, the usual three suspects of, of the shifts. Yeah. And then the new category emerges, right? And some companies are able I like like you, some of the ones you mentioned are able to jump into the new category, right. lead it, make the tough decisions, sacrifice the core business. I can right. tell you, even in a small company, it's very hard when you're doing these shifts because you're yeah. it's like killing your children a little yes, bit. It right, is like right? killing your children. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And not that I've ever yeah. done that. So just to be <laughs> all three <laughs> alive and well, just to be to be precise. <laughs> if you're <laughs> no plans, <laughs> it's, if you're listening to this, but but the the fascinating part is this jumping into new categories, right? To yeah. me, and and having an eye for it, and then the the discipline to make the tough decisions. Um, yeah. around the business. Let's talk about the relationship between a category design and positioning because they're some, yep. they're closely aligned, but they're not one and the same. And I would right. love to hear right. your take on this. Yeah. I, I can't create So first of all, 
I'm a little bit different from the play bigger team that that yeah. feels that you can just constantly be creating new categories. I think creating a new category is an incredibly rare event, incredibly rare. A category, for, for one thing, the word category means there's more than one company in it. So create, you're not really creating a category. What you're creating is a new space that you may or may not attract other people into. So it's much more nascent thing to me than creating a, a category. And also it's very expensive to try to create a category. I've worked with a number of companies who've insisted on creating a, a new category with their product and they spend millions and millions of dollars and they never get there because it's just incredibly difficult. What I prefer is people thinking about category more, much more strategic than that. So you can move yourself from the category that you're in to another category if you choose to. So Reed Hastings did that, right? He was in the red envelope business and okay. he moved himself into a, the streaming business, which was already existing. He didn't invent streaming, right? It was already existing, but he moved, he shifted, he steered the company into that category with to great to a lot of danger for him, right? Because the shareholders were like, wait, what are you doing? What are you doing? But I think that category can be super strategic. In my book, I talk about the, the category creation we did for Cisco. And that was a very unusual category creation. So Cisco was in the hubs and routers business, right? And what we saw for them is that and what John Chambers said to me when he brought us on, he said, I know we can stand for something much more than hubs and routers, but I don't know what it is. At the time, we looked around and we saw the internet emerging. And we said, you know what? There's a company called Microsoft that owns the software part of this industry, a company called Intel that owns the hardware part of this industry, but there's nobody holding up the internet part of this industry because it's too nascent. So hubs and routers are required to make the internet work. Why don't you, John Chambers and Cisco, take that role? So we moved them from the category of hubs and routers, which they were still making, to the yeah. category we call the internet economy category. Yeah. Right. It changed everything for Cisco. So you got to think about category very strategically. It's not just about moving from one piece to another piece. You can sometimes join categories of companies that don't belong in your space, like Cisco did with Intel and Microsoft, or brand new models like Reed yeah. did with, with streaming. So anyway, it's a very strategic decision, which informs your positioning. And by the way, context is everything as it relates to what category you're in. We never could have done that with Cisco had the internet not been emerging. That would not have worked. That's very interesting. And I actually picked up one of the sto another stories from you where you helped then John Chambers uh, be uh, positioning himself as well, yes. where he would be a peer to Andy Grove, yes. the CEO of Intel and Bill Gates for yep. Microsoft. Yep. And he would only speak at the events exactly. where that, the other two were. And that, that sounds that like that was a personal positioning to align was a company level position. Yes, it was a tactic that we used in order to accentuate the move from hubs and routers to internet economy. If Chambers could stop doing all of the speaking engagements he was doing, talking about hubs and routers, and only be up there with Andy Grove and Bill Gates, we it, it, it would create the illusion that those three people fit together, right? And then the press started to pick up on it, and they called it Wintelco for Windows, Intel, Cisco, and it just took off. So it's category is just a, such a strategic decision. And here's what I'd like to say last about category. Don't let Gartner and Forrester figure out your category for you, mm. right? They have a business model that is dependent upon them telling you what your category is. That's fine. They can keep doing that. But when you're talking about positioning your company for value creation, you own your category. You own the decision about category, not Gartner and Forrester. Yeah, I think one of the more interesting things that I, I think is still not very well understood is how do you take people from an existing maybe category or product space and find find the early adapters from that to move into this new space, right? Like I think the where which is the one that you want to be the leader and whether you call it a category or new positioning. And I think the the reason I think companies fail and it's very hard is because you think they're all separated somehow. You just find this, create this new category right. from a vacuum, like it magically just appears because everything happened. But in reality, there's already people trying to do certain things somewhere yeah. else that are failing or the, they're not as happy with that. And there's yeah. select group and you got to pull them in whatever category, whatever gardener, pointed them to and they say, hey, if you're that type of person, here's a new 
approach for you. It feels like that part is harder to do than just to think up categories in a brainstorming session. Yeah, which is easy to do, but very expensive to make, to turn into reality. The the yeah. other thing I'd like to bring into this equation is that, again, what Jack Trout and Al Reese said in their first book on positioning, which is it's about real estate in the mind of the customer, right? Yeah. About real estate in the mind of the customer. When you're creating a new category that has a new name and a new thing, do you think there's any real estate in the mind of the customer on that? None. There's zero. You have to identify that real estate. First, you have to stake it out. Then you have to identify it. Then you have to buy it. And then you have to defend it. It's very expensive and time consuming to do that. It's just Im almost impossible. So what you're better off doing is go into a, ex an existing spot of real estate in the brain of your customer and then differentiate right? Create a subcategory. This is what Dodge did with the minivan, right? They were in the automotive market. And when the minivan opportunity presented itself, which by the way, was an accident, they were able to create a new subcategory within the automotive space in the brain. So people could see, oh, this is a car just like every other car, except it has this other functionality. And that's the best way to create a new category is to think about a subcategory so that you can enter the brain in a familiar space, not an unfamiliar space. And I think that's fascinating to bring the back to Cybertrack, which those of our audiences that are in, in the California are seeing a lot more of probably than other. There are a lot of, of them world. around. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it is a category, it is to some degree almost a category of one, but I think it's a brilliant way of positioning something that is so unique that it like you cannot confuse it with any other truck, electric or otherwise. And so that is whatever you think of the experience for the right people, there is no confusion. You don't have to choose between Ford or or, or some other right. truck. There is this thing and it's a thing. Exactly. Uh, but that's a subcategory of what Tesla was already doing. Exactly. Interesting. So that's a subcategory within Tesla. Yeah. Okay. So on that, uh, to start wrapping up, because we could go on for forever here. I'm learning yes. so much. Last question the what would you say is the branding opportunity for individuals right like how do they position themselves in in into the world especially in a noisy world that we live in yeah i think having a really outgoing personality is probably the number one criteria of being able to do that so that's the the first thing but secondly if you look at all of the internet influencers all of these people who are online acting as influencers for makeup brands, fashion brands, experience brands, travel brands, all of this stuff. They have super outgoing personalities and they love to, to illustrate how they are standing out as an individual brand. So it's either the way they dress or the way they look or the way they talk. And, they, and people want to be like that. They want to be like these people who stand out. Everybody wants to stand out, but not everybody's capable of doing it. So first, I have to say, you have to have the underlying capabilities to, to build a personal brand. And then secondly, it's about content. So this is what I love about your thing, the content experience platform, right? That's the only way you can do it. It's content, content, and all different kinds of content, written content, video content, image content. All of this stuff is about how you build your brand. And the more you do it, the closer you'll get to building it. So brilliant, Andy. Well, you stand out over generations and bringing the lessons that I think we could all learn today from the past and then applying the new innovative ideas today. So it was such a great chat. Where could people pick up your book, connect with Thanks. you? Um, Thank you. The book is on Amazon. It's Get to Aha by Andy Cunningham. And I would, would love people's feedback about it. You can reach out to me at andy at andycunningham.com. Love to chat with people about their opinions about all of these matters of marketing. And that's great. And you can uh, reach me through my own company's website, which is get to aha, G E T, the number two, A H A, get to aha.com. Brilliant. Everyone, please do that if you want to understand what Steve Jobs had as an unfair advantage. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, <laughs> Thank uh, you, for Ivan. listening. Thanks, and thank you so much, Andy, for sharing your okay. expertise.